This is the first video of a series that is going to talk about how a VHDL process block works. So process block, in terms of syntax, has three parts. There's the keyword process at the beginning and end process at the end. So that's denoting the actual process block itself. A second, we have this sensitivity list, and we'll spend a whole video on that later. So actually more than, more than one video. And then inside we have the process body, which I've just put a comment here in, in this example, but there will be a series of statements in this body. And the body begins with this keyword begin and then ends at the end of the process down at the bottom. Now, if you go and read things online or in a lot of textbooks, um, a process is often described as a sequential block of code within what is normally a concurrent VHDL architecture. Um, and so what people mean by that um, is that normally in a VHDL architecture, all of the statements are concurrent. They're all happening simultaneously. So for example, I've written a simple module that's a, a three input NAND gate, and we're gonna compute this with this intermediate signal that we'll call AND3. So AND3 is A and B and C. And so if we were just drawing out a circuit for that, We've got this three input AND gate, and it's gonna take A and B and C. And then the next statement says Y has the value of not AND3. So we take the value of that, we run it through an inverter, and this output thing here is Y. Okay, but it turns out, and you, you may or may not have actually run into this so far, we can put these statements in either order. So we could swap these and do them the other way around, and it works just fine. I mean, that, that's because essentially if we're specifying the behavior of this circuit, of the wiring of this circuit, this intermediate wire here is AND3. And it doesn't matter if I specify Y in terms of AND3 before I specify AND3 in terms of A, B, and C, as long as I hook up the whole thing, um, as long as I've eventually specified all the behavior, it doesn't matter which order I put the statements in. Right? And when I build the circuit, it's not like one thing is happening before the other so much, it's just the whole circuit is it's a piece of hardware and it's, it's executing all at once, it's, it's just running. Okay, so in contrast to this, the process has sequential statements. Um, or at least people will say that the statements inside a process are executed sequentially. So this is technically true, and it, it's the terminology that gets used by the VHDL reference manual, like the official specification from the IEEE. Um, but it is incomplete uh, to the point of being misleading and not helpful at all. Okay, so let, let me try to break down what that means and and what a process block is actually doing. Okay, so the statements execute sequentially. Um, th this is the part that's, that's technically true, but with this huge caveat that signals don't change their value until some time passes. Okay, and this is in contrast to every procedural programming language that you have dealt with uh, or will deal with. So when a signal is assigned inside a process, so for example, in these first couple of lines, um, A gets the value one, B gets the value zero, those new values get queued up, at least conceptually, um, but they do not get applied until some time passes. So subsequent statements which use that signal will not refer to the new value. They will refer to the current value because no time has passed since some new value was assigned. Okay, let's look at this example here and, and try to work out how it works. So at time t equals zero, we're just gonna draw a timeline here because often a helpful way to think about what's going on. So at t equals zero, uh, and we're, we'll measure time in nanoseconds. Initially, the signals actually don't have any particular value, but um, A is assigned the value one, and B is gonna be assigned the value 
zero. So A is going to start out up here, and B is going to start down here. Now, as soon as we hit the weight statement, uh, those values are applied, and 10 nanoseconds pass. So we'll move forward to 10 nanoseconds. And so A is going to have the value 1 until 10 nanoseconds, and B is going to have the value 0 until 10 nanoseconds. Then at time t equals 10 nanoseconds, A gets to assigned the value of B. So B is currently 0, so A is going to get the value B here and drop down to 0. And here, b is assigned the value of a as, as the next statement in this sequence. Okay, now, if you're thinking in terms of software, a has the value here of 0, and so b is going to get the value 0, which it already has, and everything is just going to be 0. But this is not software, and a's value has not changed yet. No time has actually passed here since this, this update was queued up. Okay, if you want to think about it like mathematically, maybe like you were looking at sort of the, the limit coming up to this side. Um, what, what was the value here, not the value that just got, got queued up? Okay, so B is going to be assigned the current value of A, which is still 1. And so B is going to do this. And then we hit the wait statement. We're going to step forward for 10 nanoseconds again. And now we're at 20 nanoseconds. Okay, now we've hit the end of the process, and we'll talk about what happens with that in the next video. So the important thing here to understand is, yes, statements do execute sequentially. They, they do run in order. But because the signals don't change until time passes, it's kind of like they all do happen at once. It's like everything in the process is happening simultaneously, or at least until you hit the wait statement. And pretty soon we're actually going to have process blocks that don't use any wait statements at all. That's going to be a pretty normal paradigm. And so therefore everything in the process block is going to happen exactly simultaneously. And so all of this terminology about saying, well, these statements execute sequentially, again, is, is not the most helpful terminology. It's, it's technically true. It's, it's the way the simulator thinks about what's going on and evaluating the statements. But in terms of what's happening with the circuit, it's not true at all. So before I move on and, and wrap up this video, I just want to acknowledge that this is difficult. This is paradigm breaking, right? We, we've introduced a construct that basically breaks all of the rules you've spent so much time practicing and learning about how like normal procedural programming languages should work. Um, so if it takes, if you struggle with this a bit and it takes some time to get it in your head or if it's just making your brain hurt, that's okay, that's normal. Um, and you will get it with some practice. Just make sure that you keep it in mind that, that this is how VHDL is intended to operate. It's not like it's some crummy version of C just with, with weird syntax and weird rules. It was created intentionally to have this behavior because it's useful for specifying circuits. In the next video, we're going to talk about a couple use cases for the sensitivity list and talk about how that can be applied to actually create test benches and create circuits that do interesting things.